Thank you for joining us here this morning as we launch the latest open budget survey looking at the state of budget transparency, participation and accountability uh, around the world in 2015. Now, it's been three years since the last survey. Normally, there's a gap of two years, but the reason that there has been such a gap is to try and improve the mechanics of the survey to give it more relevance uh, to governments, to the public and to civil society. We'll have a number of guests that we will be addressing some of the issues that have been uncovered in the 2015 survey. But before we do that, I would welcome uh, Sri, who is, of course, as you know, the uh, managing director of the World Bank Group, uh, to welcome you here on behalf of the World Bank as we get this underway. Ladies and gentlemen, Sri Miliani. for me to be here for the World Bank Group to host the launch of um, the 2015 Open Budget Survey Report. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. So I have to repeat, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alan, and also the IBB colleague. It is really great pleasure for me on behalf of the World Bank Group to welcome you and I saw as a host of this, uh, the launch of the 2015 Open Budget Survey Report. We also part of the 2012 survey launch. And then as now we, we see that uh, this is an excellent opportunity to reflect on the progress made toward making spending decision more transparent and understandable for citizens. We are therefore want to congratulate the International Budget Partnership on this latest report that is certain to have a global impact. For us in the bank, it is very important, this openness as well as the transparency of the budget is a very important issue. We know that an open and transparent budget improve development outcome. Many of countries, especially developing countries, the role of budget is very critical to achieve a lot of development goal. So how the citizen knows about the budget is very critical. And transparency is only one part of all this uh, step to make all the citizen and all stakeholders to understand their own budget. Um, the truly, uh, this effort is also truly make an impact. Many of the citizen and stakeholder definitely need to participate and their demand also included uh, in this case to ask policy maker to be more transparent in terms of the policy choice, both on the revenue side as well as on the spending side. And that will also force them to be more accountable, not only about the choice, but the effectiveness of the policy. This is an important oversight of the budget execution by formal accountability institution. And together, this criteria lead to a more efficient and effective use of public resources and eventually can build trust between citizens and their government. I will give you an example in South Africa, the effective use of budget data by civil society to initiate dialogue with the government has led to increased budget allocation for child support. In India and Uganda, access to budget data triggered expenditure tracking, which identified leakages and bottlenecks and help improve the use of development resources in rural community. There is also emerging evidence linking open budget to improve service delivery. In Brazil, Mexico, and India, all point to the fact that uh, the study there uh, point to the fact that participatory budget contribution uh, contributed to lower infant mortality. So there is really a very strong obvious correlation between the participatory budget with the development indicator. That can also increase basic services coverage and also improve targeting of social protection program. While we pursue our goal of ending extreme poverty and ensuring that all citizens benefit from more prosperity, we work with our client to enhance the transparency and predictability of their budget 
increase citizen engagement across the budget cycle, and strengthening formal oversight. We have also supported initiatives such as Boost, a public expenditure monitoring database and tools, and the open budget portal, that through which country can make budget data easily accessible to the public. 17 countries are now using the platform, including Brazil, Kenya, Mexico, Moldova, and Tunisia. And the list is expanding, which is very encouraging. The Open Budget Index and Survey that we are launching today is extremely helpful for all of us in the global community who are working on this agenda, from academia to civil society to the development partner and also for the government. Their survey gives a snapshot of the extent to which the country are opening their budget and it tracked changes over time starting in 2006 when the first survey was conducted. And we will hear in detail about this emerging trend in a moment when Vivek present the result. And right now I would like to highlight the following. First, the survey, ranks, uh, the, the survey rankings show that open budget can be done regardless of the level of development. Note that of the 30 top performing countries, 14 are developing countries. So the open budget is not only the privilege, or in this case, the, 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 the only um, the level of achievement that can only be done for advanced uh, developed country. Developing country can really do a lot of uh, both policy, law, as well as practice to make them to be truly open budget. The second one, the report underscore an upward trend, and this is encouraging. It means that countries' budget are more open than before. And moreover, there are important gains in budget transparency among the least transparent countries. So I think more and more the least transparent is becoming isolated or less uh, adopted practice by many countries in the world. In East Asia and Africa countries, for example, Philippines and Malawi, they are actually leading these positive trends. Let's take my own country, Indonesia. I always agreed to come to participate in this forum because I always have a very soft spot and passion about this. As a former finance minister in Indonesia, I know exactly well what is the nature of this open budget. And I was excited when I was in Indonesia and starting to become finance minister in late 2005. We have at least inherited a law which is recently at that time changed because of the financial crisis. In the past, it's very close, centralized budget, which is actually we really don't know whether there is a check and balances between government and the parliament to become a very open, decentralized, and very transparent process, as well as the requirement to disclose the information. So Indonesia has made an overall, in this case, the ranking improvement. In 2006, the score was 42 point, and this year it is 59 point, with 100 being the highest possible score, of course. And this is quite encouraging. I know having a law is one thing. Disclosing the information of the budget is another thing. At that time, when I was finance minister, I was wondering whether the civil society knows how to read budget. I even, in this case, very seriously concerned that even the academician and researchers cannot or are not familiar with the way we present the information. So uploading or publishing the budget is only necessary but not necessarily sufficient condition for this kind of what you call it benefit of understanding the budget for a quality policy making process as well as the choice of the policy. So you really have to invest a lot. At that time, I have to even encourage the high school student. We have a competition like the, the Olympiad for the high school student how to read and analyze the budget. 
that was a very exciting to hear that then even at the high school they understand the format of budget i mean the book is this thick so no one really want to read that thick and i was also wonder every time you read especially local newspaper which is matters a lot because it was read also by local politician the way the newspaper or media understand the budget is also worrying so when you publish not necessarily that actually they can capture they can write and analyze so a lot of things need to still to be done not to mention of course there is always an interest group who don't want to disclose the budget so this is the thing that i think it will be very important in the work by this uh, partnership and all the group here is very critical for many country first of course to take a very important step of opening the budget, disclosing it, having a more transparency. But I think the work still need to be done to all of us to make this openness really matter in improving the quality of the public policy in general, but most importantly also in the budget policy, whether this is related to the revenue side as well as on the spending side. Um, and the third finding of this is four countries in the survey, Brazil, Norway, South Africa, and the United States, score well in terms of budget transparency, public participation, and effective oversight. This point to more, uh, this point to more work to be done. And of course, finally, we need more evidence. Much more systematic documentation and analysis of its impact on sustainable development outcome is needed to strengthen the case for transparency, participation, and accountability in the budget. So the bottom line here is that the open budget survey lays an important foundation on which we are all need to build. I want to, uh, to thank all of you, and especially the partners who involved in this uh, important initiative and I do hope that you all enjoy the session, but most importantly, have a very productive meeting in which you can improve and support more and more many countries who try to do the right thing, to open the budget, and finally to improve their policy choice that will eventually benefit especially the poor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sri. Uh, let me explain how we're, we're going to try and work uh, this morning. Uh, we have a number of guests, as you can see, our panelists here will also be joined by video link uh, from South Africa and the Philippines. Uh, we'll have Florencio Abad, the Secretary of the Development of Budget and Management in the Philippines, Neil Cole, who's the Executive Secretary for the Collaborative Africa Budget Reform Initiative, Daniela Balu Erez, I hope I pronounced that, who is the Senior Advisor for Development to the US Secretary of State, is here with us, as is Mario Marcel, Senior Director for Governance Global Practices at the World Bank Group. Warren Krafchik, the Executive Director of the International Budget Partnership, is here as well. And Paul O'Brien, who is the Vice President for Policy and Advocacy of Oxfam America. All will give a short address. We will then have a few questions to them, and we will open it up to, to the floor. Although if at some point uh, after the presentations, if someone's bursting to ask a question, please let us know and we can always uh, introduce it at that point. But before we move on to that, it would be helpful to have uh, an overview of what the International Budget Partnership has been doing, particularly uh, with the report for 2015. And Vivek Ramkumar will give us the overview of that. Vivek. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Vivek Ramkumar, and it's a real honor to be here with you all. Let me start by first uh, thanking a very dear friend of the IBP who's made this event possible, Jeff Thindwa, who's taken time off from his vacation last month to, to make this event possible. We're very grateful to you, Jeff. This year is of special significance for the international development community. Later this month, Countries will finalize the Sustainable Development Goals, which will be implemented over the next 15 years. And in November, governments will finalize and agree upon the Climate Change Treaty. Effective implementation of these agreements will enable significant progress to be achieved in combating poverty and addressing many of the world's most pressing 
development challenges. However, the ultimate effectiveness of these agreements will depend in no small part on the national budget policies that are adopted to support their implementation and whether resources mobilized are spent efficiently and effectively. There is cause for concern. We know from prior experience that for development initiatives to be successful, we must cultivate strong budget institutions, encourage governments to be more open and accountable on their budgets, and mobilize active and engaged citizens. It's in this context that the International Budget Partnership releases its 2015 Open Budget Survey and Open Budget Index to profile the state of budget transparency and accountability. The Open Budget Survey is the only independent and comparative measure of budget transparency in the world. The survey assesses whether national governments produce and disseminate to the public eight key and basic budget documents during the course of the year. These include budget plans, execution reports, and audit reports. The survey also assesses the extent of effective budget oversight provided by legislatures and supreme audit institutions and opportunities for public participation in budgeting. The survey uses a questionnaire that contains 140 indicators on budget transparency and accountability, which are drawn from international good practices and standards. Each country is assigned a score ranging from 0 to 100 based on its levels of budget transparency. These scores enable comparisons across countries and over time. The IBP ensures that the survey data are of the highest quality through a rigorous 18-month research process that involves one researcher and one peer reviewer in every country in the survey. Both these individuals and their organizations are not affiliated to government. The IBP also invites national governments to review draft results of the survey. The Open Budget Survey is not only a research instrument, it's also an advocacy tool that IBP and its partners use to dialogue with governments on budget transparency and accountability reforms. There are three key findings from the 2015 survey that I share with you. First, there are major gaps in the amount of budget information that governments are making available to their citizens. The average score received by the 102 countries assessed on the 2015 Open Budget Index is only 45 out of a maximum possible score of 100. One third of the total number of budget documents that should be published worldwide are not made available to citizens. These documents are either not produced, produced for the government's internal use only, or published too late to be useful. The survey also finds that even when budget documents are published, they frequently lack sufficient information. Statistical analysis undertaken by the IBP on OBI results reveal that countries with higher income, freer press, and more democratic traditions tend to have higher OBI scores and are perceived to be less corrupt. But the investigation also threw up some interesting results. Countries with scores between 41 and 60 on the index are as likely to publish budget documents as those with scores above 60. Although the published budget documents in countries with greater budget transparency tend to be more comprehensive. Further, countries with scores between zero and 40 on the index tend to be wealthier than countries that score between 41 and 60 on the index. This finding likely reflects the fact that many countries that are heavily dependent on revenues from the sale of hydrocarbons perform very poorly on budget transparency. A second finding from our survey is that there's a gradual trend towards improvements in budget transparency. And some of the highest improvements are taking place in countries that were formerly at the bottom of the open budget index. The average score received by 40 countries for whom comparable data is available has improved by nearly 20% in the past decade. Some of the highest improvers include such countries as the Kyrgyz Republic, Tunisia, and countries in Francophone Africa, whose scores quadrupled between the 2010 and 2015 surveys. Optimism generated by this recent progress in budget transparency 
nevertheless needs to be tempered by at least two considerations. First, a large number of countries with unacceptably low levels of budget transparency are simply failing to advance any meaningful budget transparency reforms. And second, volatility in government budget transparency practices makes it very difficult for anyone to be able to understand or meaningfully monitor several national government budgets. For example, the year-end budget report in Ghana was not produced in 2006, was produced for the government's internal use only in 2008, was published in 2010, was not available in 2012, and was again published in 2015. A third key finding from the survey is that problems associated with lack of budget transparency are compounded by few opportunities for public participation and inadequate budget oversight institutions, ineffective budget oversight institutions. The average score received by the 102 countries assessed on indicators of public participation in the 2015 survey is only 25 out of a maximum possible score of 100. This finding shows that meaningful channels for the public to participate in the formal budgeting process simply do not exist in the vast majority of countries assessed. But the survey finds that some innovations are being advanced in the field. National legislatures in more than a dozen countries are organizing public hearings during which representatives from the public are provided opportunities to testify on budget issues. The participatory budgeting model, first introduced in Brazilian municipalities, is now being experimented at the national level in the Philippines. And the South Korean Audit Office introduced an innovative citizen audit request system to make their audit functions more relevant to citizens. While civil society and citizen budget monitoring work is important, it cannot and should not replace the role played by formal government institutions in providing comprehensive oversight. But the 2015 survey finds that national legislatures in more than half the countries assessed do not have access to ad any or adequate research staff to help them analyze hundreds and oftentimes thousands of pages of budget documents that are tabled before national legislatures each year for approval. The survey also finds that supreme audit institutions in the vast majority of countries assessed do not have quality assurance systems to support the audits that they are conducting. These findings are significant because the design of the Open Budget Survey is based on the premise that efficient, effective, and accountable budgets rest on three pillars of budget transparency, public participation in budgeting, and strong oversight provided by formal government institutions. But the 2015 survey finds that only four of 102 countries assessed are solid on each of these three pillars, while 32 countries fail to meet the survey standard of adequacy on any of these three measures. The right package of budget reforms for any country depend on the specific deficiencies in its budget systems. Accordingly, the IBP publishes individual country summaries with tailored recommendations. But the survey findings also lend themselves to five general recommendations that apply to different categories of countries and to stakeholders who are interested in more than one country. First, governments and other stakeholders must work to increase the number of budget documents that are published in countries that score between 0 and 40 on the Open Budget Index, and increase the comprehensiveness and the usefulness of published budget documents in countries that score between 41 and 60 on the Open Budget Index. Second, everyone must work to ensure that gains in budget transparency are not reversed, perhaps by embedding these into national laws and budget regulations. Third, national legislatures must support the establishment of open legislative hearings, during which members of the public are provided opportunities to testify on important budget issues. And the executive branch must consider mechanisms like participatory budgeting and social audits to obtain public inputs during budget formulation and implementation. Fourth, government oversight institutions must be strengthened by providing national legislatures with access to independent research capacity and supreme audit institutions with access to quality assurance systems. 
And finally, no one should be satisfied if a government is strong on one pillar of budget accountability or even two, but not all three. Last year, I met with a colleague from Africa who told me about his interaction with a finance ministry official whom he had met to discuss public participation in budgeting. Annoyed by my colleague's persistent demands for public participation, the official turned to him and said, you guys are never satisfied. Although we met your demands for greater budget transparency, you're now demanding public participation in budgeting. It seems that it's not enough that we've invited you for dinner. You now demand to be taken into the kitchen. But my colleague was right in not being satisfied by greater budget transparency alone. He knows, as we do, that for strong checks and balances to be in place, budget systems must be transparent and open to public engagement and scrutiny and have robust oversight institutions and mechanisms. Such systems, in turn, can ensure that there are strong checks and balances in place, which will improve the collection and allocation of scarce national resources and are critical to the success of global initiatives, such as those that are seeking to reduce poverty and address the grave dangers of climate change. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to check to see if we've got the link to the Philippines. I know we were having a few technical issues there, but I suspect, given that we have a big camera with a line through it, that would suggest we are not connected to the Philippines. It is 9 o'clock or 9.30 in the evening there, so we're grateful for them staying up to, to join us. Uh, in that case, what we will do, though, is go to uh, Pretoria, where Neil Cole, who the Executive Secretary of the Collaborative Africa Budget Reform Initiative is joining us. Hopefully, uh, Neil can hear us. Uh, Neil, we'll hopefully pull you up on the big screen rather than the very small envelope we have at the bottom of the screen. But I'd like to ask you, first of all, your takeaway from uh, this year's report, what you think the main points are and how you have been able to build on some success in the area that you cover. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me just confirm that you can hear me. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, it's um, really grateful for the invitation to participate in the launch of the 2015 report. Um, I mean, we, we, we're very pleased by what we see in the results from the African countries where we have worked. I mean, our work on budget transparency, while not um, covering all of Africa, uh, provides a very good example or very good sample of what, what is going on. Um, this was a joint project between Cabri and the IBP, um, with the focus countries being the DRC, Kenya and, and Tunisia, and um, um, with, with about 16 countries that, that um, joined that exercise as peer countries so, for example, when we worked in, in Kenya, we took South Africa, Liberia, and Lesotho along with us, um, and, and a similar number of, of peers in, in Tunisia. So we, we're pleased to see that the results um, for the DRC have, have improved um, um, by almost doubling. Um, we, we're also very pleased to see that the results for Tunisia have, have improved when compared with the previous, with the previous survey. There's obviously something um, that's going on in, in, in Kenya that is causing the, the results to be stuck or in actual fact dropping by, by one point. Um, and, and when looking at countries that are hovering in that 40 to 50 range, we, we are concerned that they seem to be to be stuck there and have been stuck there um, since, since about 20, 2010. Um, I think there are, there are reasons that we can certainly explore um, in, 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 in this discussion and also in, in future work that we can undertake um, jointly and, and in each of our organizations on ways to improve, improve budget transparency. Um, 
just on some of the challenges that I think um, persist um, that, that will require further focus. The one is obviously in the legislation and where the legislation provides sufficient basis for countries to, to improve. Um, we, we certainly find that in, in Francophone African countries, um, that whilst legislation is, is a requirement, um, the, the results have been varied in terms of whether putting in place legislation does, does contribute towards greater, greater transparency. Um, so in Burkina Faso, there seems to not have been um, improvement as a direct result of legislation, but more as a result of the country um, um, dealing with some of the improvements um, through tackling what appears to be the lower hanging hanging fruits. Whereas in Senegal, the directors from WAMU and also having the legislation in place seems to have contributed significantly to an improvement in, 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 in Senegal's um, score. Um, the second, the second challenge that, that we, that we have discovered that, that remains is the one of, of political will, um, where putting in place the legislation is, is not, is not enough, but what is required is for the leadership in politics and also the leadership within, within the administration to move beyond the directives, to move beyond the legislation and to and, and, and to, to um, work towards improving, improving transparency. Um, weak processes um, or stronger processes within, within legislators certainly have, have an impact on um, whether transparency improves, um, or whether gains are, are, are reversed, and also where um, things seem to be, seem to be stagnating. Um, the one that, that Vivek also mentioned, um, which we think has an important, has an important um, impact, um, that is um, the state of um, supreme audit institutions, um, whether they are able to bring out their audits on time and also the quality of, of those audits is quite important when we're looking at the information on, on what has been happening with expenditure. Um, lack of technical and, and financial management capacity is certainly one that that remains. And then the final the final challenge that that we think um, remains and 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 where we're not, um, I, I believe, paying sufficient attention to is whether there is in fact a a, a threshold um, for for many countries. So we see improvements in countries that scored very low in previous surveys, doubling, tripling um, their, their scores, but this is from eight to 30 or from 10 to 40. Um, and when countries get to that, to that 40, 50 um, um, mark, um, they, seem to, they seem to be stuck. So I think we need to understand better what is happening there. Um, is there a threshold um, that requires maybe more radical change to 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 um, to the practices, to to the policies, the procedures that is going to get a country breaking beyond that that threshold into the seventy um, into the seventy range. Um, so, in in a quick summary, um, we were certainly pleased with um, especially the countries that we were working in and 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 the countries that came along as peers in the countries we were working in um, um, with, with the result. Um, um, uh, but we still believe that, that there are challenges that remain and, and certainly um, areas for, for further if, um, work that, um, that, that CABRI can undertake and, and preferably undertake this in collaboration with, with the IBP because it did allow us an opportunity to do something um, quite innovative, and that was to undertake this exercise um, as a joint exercise um, where we had the participation of government officials um, and, and civil society representatives. Thank you very much. Mr. Cole, thank you very much indeed. I know we'll be coming back to you with a few questions to ask, but we want to go now uh, via video link to the Philippines and hopefully 
Florencio Abad, who's the Secretary of the Department of Budget and Management in the Philippines, can hear us and has taken his uh, microphone off mute. Uh, the Philippines made impressive progress towards greater budget transparency since the last survey back in 2012, with an increase in its OBI score from 48 to 64. So the question, Mr. Secretary, must be, how did you manage it and what lessons can be learned by others? Well, first of all, let me uh, thank uh, the Open Budget uh, Survey for this huge uh, improvement in uh, our rating from uh, 48 to uh, 64, the highest uh, we've ever actually uh, registered. And uh, it, it's certainly a recognition for the work that uh, we have been doing here, not just the government, but in partnership with uh, our oversight agencies as well as uh, civil society institutions and uh, the local government uh, units. We are certainly uh, encouraged uh, by uh, this recognition. It wasn't easy at the start, but uh, you know, this administration, the administration of uh, President Enoy uh, Aquino, uh, came into being on the shoulders of what we call people power. And the president has uh, remained committed to a social contract where the uh, regime of transparency, uh, accountability, and engagement with the uh, citizens has been uh, given uh, a very high priority in the way uh, the, the Aquino administration governs uh, the country. And uh, as a result of that, uh, a lot of initiatives in uh, the participation of the citizenry in governance uh, has sprouted in one area that has been uh, a very rich area for engagement has been the uh, budget process, particularly in the budget uh, preparation uh, process, uh, all the way to budget implementation and uh, accountability. And the uh, initial difficulties of understanding an esoteric uh, subject such as uh, the budget was overcome by the willingness of uh, uh, the, the government and civil society groups uh, to work together in trying to, uh, as much as possible, promote budget literacy and simplifying uh, you know, the budget process. And uh, the uh, great benefit from this has been a greater interest in um, understanding uh, the budget as well as the budget process and engaging uh, the government. And the result of all of this really has been uh, a greater uh, exercise of oversight uh, over the budget and uh, in response, a better setting of priorities on the part of uh, the government. For example, if you compare the uh, public investments in uh, uh, social protection, principally conditional cash transfer from 2010 to, uh, to today, you would see uh, a 500% you know, increase uh, in the uh, public investment and an increase from 800,000 household beneficiaries to about 4.3 million. The same in, case, in the case of uh, a basic uh, education. It used to be the case where you know, classroom and teacher shortages were the uh, uh, headlines as the schools open, but that is not the case today because we've been able to double the budget of basic education. The same with uh, public health. We have uh, tripled the budget of public health. And in the case of infrastructure, uh, we have uh, quintupled the budget of infrastructure simply because we have been able to collect tax as well, manage our liabilities, and uh, minimize leakages and, uh, uh, and decrease the uh, bottlenecks or inefficiencies. And this has a lot to do with uh, an exchange between uh, government agencies and uh, uh, beneficiary groups insofar as uh, priorities and uh, the way uh, government implements the budget. So all of this put together is, is, is showing us uh, a better way of uh, using public funds uh, and in, in the process generating uh, greater uh, credibility, credibility as well as, uh, as, well as uh, supportiveness from the citizenry and also and from, also from uh, the, investing uh, the investing public. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much indeed. Please stay with us because uh, I know people will have questions uh, particularly for you. So we're grateful that you're taking this time late at night in the Philippines. And we should point out you're not actually in Manila 
you're some distance away from Manila, so that's why we may be experiencing intermittent problems with your picture, but we're certainly hearing you loud and clear. Uh, if you could just uh, mute your microphone, though, Mr. Secretary, that will stop uh, my sound coming back round. We'd like to say hi to your advisor who's helping you out there. <laughs> it suddenly yeah. appeared on screen. Thank you for that. Uh, I'd now like to introduce uh, Daniela Balu Ares, who's the Senior Advisor for Development to the US Secretary of State, and she can perhaps give us uh, her view on what she thinks from the, uh, this year's report. Sure. I wanted to pull something up on the screen if I can. Can you do the screen? Okay, well, I'll start, and then hopefully the screen will follow. Um, so thank you. Uh, I think Vivek started earlier with a reminder of what, what this year brings in terms of development and a couple of really extraordinary uh, agreements in the sustainable development goals that will be adopted at a head of state summit in just a few weeks at the end of September in New York, and then the climate agreement later this year. Um, and I'd suggest that those agreements um, present a really uh, interesting opportunity for uh, open the overall open budget movement and what the goals of that effort are. Uh, so, but let me just start for a moment in terms of. Um, as we think about, and what will hopefully go up on the screen, is a very nice graphic of what the goals are and the 17 goals that will be agreed uh, in uh, at the end of this month. Um, and I think what's, what's interesting about these goals is they represent a different type of global development agenda um, when you compare them to the Millennium Development Goals um, that preceded them and were agreed uh, in 2000. And what's, what they maintain from the Millennium Development Goals, those eight goals, is a focus on measurable targets of progress over a 15-year period. Uh, so this, this, these new goals will have um, targets and, and, and indicators that are ways to tell us if we're making progress on health, on education, on deforestation, on the, other, on the full range, gender equity, et cetera, on the full range of issues uh, that these goals represent. Uh, but they, they in, a, in many other ways, they are, they are different than the first goals. And that reflects the change in where we are and really makes the need for things like open budgets, really strong data and progress, really critical. So a couple of things about how things have changed um, since we reached uh, the Millennium Development Goals and, and now this new agreement. One, the Millennium Development Goals were really more of a North-South agreement. So they were more about how does the North um, and, and donors assist in addressing some key social issues like health and education. This agenda is now really universal. It's meant to apply to all countries. Second, uh, the Millennium Development Goals were social. Now we have a full range of social, economic, and environmental issues, again, really touching on the full range of what government budgets um, address at a national level. Uh, third difference is that the MDGs were more oriented towards how does assistance get prioritized. Uh, this agreement now is really about how do um, all actors invest, whether it's domestic budgets, private investment, or assistance resources, and how are those then deployed to achieve a set of outcomes. And the final difference, or actually <laughs> two last differences, which is one is around data. The type of data that was available around the MDGs was while technology was evolving, you still were, are, have been largely reliant on um, multi-year lag data to look at outcomes and indicators. Uh, and we're in a really a different data environment now. With open data movement, with mobile, with social, you're going to be able to use real-time geospatial data and other types of data to understand how we're doing. And budget data could be a key component at looking at how progress is being made on any one of these goals and what the impacts that are occurring and start in really dynamic ways um, to use this data and make it accessible and meaningful to the public um, and to decision makers. Uh, I never got my slide. Well, globalgoals.org is where you can see the nice icons of the, uh, the development goals. I suggest taking a look at it um, afterwards because I think another learning and final piece of what's different about these goals and this agreement that's relevant to, um, 
to open budgets as well is that this has been approached and, and is being approached in a way to make it very well communicated and easily communicated what these goals are, what they're trying to achieve, and link them to people's lives. And so um, what I was going to show and what globalgoals.org shows is a very nice set of icons of what the 17 new development goals are. So whether it's poverty or whether it's um, governance and peace and justice, which is goal 16 in the goals, which really relates to a lot of access to information, whether it's an, uh, a affordable and clean energy. And those um, that ability to communicate to a broad audience uh, is something that I think will really distinguish these and creates kind of a window for opportunity for everyone working on these issues um, when they're launched. At the end of September, uh, not only will there be the head of state summer, will you have over 150 heads of state uh, expected to be part of adopting this agreement, but you'll have um, leader speaking about it from you know Malala to the Pope to um, stars that um, apparently are very popular, but I only heard of from my kids after like One Direction or, <laughs> or Beyonce or others. I'd heard of Beyonce, but. <laughs> so we're moving from an agenda that's kind of was um, very powerful in the Millennium Development Goals, but still in a narrower community to one that's much more public and known broadly. Uh, so I would just suggest, uh, you, budget data on related to all of those goals is going to be a, a real opportunity. We are really prioritizing data as a foundational element of this agenda because it's really what's going to determine if um, we can know if these goals are meaningful or not, is the availability of data. And we've joined with partners across government, civil society, the private sector um, to build a partnership that was announced, uh, initially announced in Addis Ababa, the Financing for Development Conference, um, a, a partnership on sustainable development data that focuses on sharing and opening data related to sustainable development, using it, um, and building capacity for its use. Uh, so countries like Mexico, Kenya, Senegal, uh, Colombia, uh, and others are, are coming on board. Um, along with civil society, organizations like Civicus, the World Bank is a partner, over 40 organizations and companies like mobile companies who have extraordinary access to data are coming together around how can data now be used to really be accessible and meaningful about progress on the goals. So uh, just to put where we are kind of in this broader development context out there and suggest there's really an opportunity now to translate what is a really critical piece of information on budgets, but not always um, as accessible, uh, um, is now, I should say critical, is open, but now really an opportunity to push the usage and translation of that budget data into uh, outcomes for the next 15 years. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Daniela. And maybe we can perhaps get her graphic up when it comes to the open forum and, and she can talk us through exactly what she was uh, trying to point out. Uh, next up, Mario Marcel, who's the Senior Director of Governance for Global Practices at the World Bank Group. Uh, I was going to give you a slightly longer introduction, but you're keen to get going, so I'll just step aside and let you <laughs> get going. Well, thank you very much, and, uh, and welcome again to the World Bank. Uh, our managing director already uh, congratulated uh, 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 the authors of this uh, report and uh, celebrated uh, this uh, new set of data, so I don't have uh, much uh, to add to that. Um, but uh, let me link uh, that with, uh, with the work that uh, we do and some of the personal experiences in dealing with uh, budget transparency. Uh, budget, budgeting is uh, probably one of the most uh, active areas of uh, cooperation uh, from the World Bank uh, to developing countries. And it has a, a very long history. It, it is uh, so long that I, I even was a client of the World Bank uh, many years ago in dealing with these issues. Um, the World Bank uh, provides uh, advice and uh, support for budget reform in many countries, and I'm uh, very glad uh, to see some of our partners and some of our clients uh, represented in this discussion, starting with uh, Secretary Abad, 
that uh, we have uh, supported over the last uh, few years, and now we are partnering again in uh, trying to ensure that the progress that has been made in the Philippines on uh, transparency and budgeting as part of that is able to continue uh, uh, across uh, the political cycle. Uh, also, I can recognize some of our clients in the countries that have been making a lot of uh, progress, like the Kyrgyz Republic, uh, and uh, also I can uh, recognize uh, our uh, friends uh, from Cabri, particularly Neil Cole, uh, who uh, is uh, the, with whom uh, we do lots of things uh, jointly in Africa, and we were together a few months ago uh, talking to the ministries of finance of Africa on this as, uh, as well as other issues. So this is an important area of work for the World Bank. There is no question about that. But uh, budget transparency is also something that I take uh, very personal. Uh, when I started uh, working as a, as a young researcher in Chile many years ago in the 1980s, uh, I had uh, to pull, uh, to put together some data. And at that time, uh, it was still the, the years of the, of the <coughs> dictatorship in Chile, and no fiscal statistics had been published for 15 years. So I had to do a kind of, uh, a kind of detective uh, work, trying to find pieces of data here and there. And I would like at this point to especially recognize uh, people that uh, later became my colleagues at the budget office in Chile that uh, risking their jobs because it was a difficult political time. They helped me find uh, some data that could be useful. But that's something that, uh, of course, we don't like uh, to happen. Uh, so uh, when I joined the, the government, the first democratic government in 1990, uh, one of my first uh, tasks was uh, to start publishing uh, fiscal data. But uh, at that time, I remember that the first time that I went to speak to my minister uh, about the functional classification of uh, spending, he said, okay, but uh, what if uh, social spending looks too low? Maybe we don't know people know, uh, know about that. So it took a little uh, uh, persuasion to, to get that uh, through. Uh, and then uh, Chile started uh, publishing uh, more and more data over the years. In the 2000s, I became a budget director. So I had uh, the, the opportunity to do some of these uh, things or to lead some of these uh, things uh, myself. And then Chile made a big jump in terms of uh, the volume and the quality of information that was uh, published. And uh, at that time, I remember that in uh, 2010, I, I think that Chile was in the sixth place in the ranking of, uh, of, the, uh, of the international, uh, of the open budget survey. Uh, but this uh, took a lot of uh, systematicity, hard work, uh, persuading uh, politicians, working with the uh, parliament, and challenging uh, some of the uh, uh, traditional institutions of, uh, of a country because uh, Chile is a very presidentialistic uh, uh, country. It's very presidential in terms of its political system. So uh, parliament has a very little role or have, has very little powers in changing uh, the budget. Uh, the uh, members of parliament can only reduce spending. They cannot increase, they cannot reallocate, they cannot uh, create new lines of spending. But in order to make the progress that uh, Chile made, we had to partner with the parliament. So we opened up opportunities for dialogue, for scrutiny, for discussion, that was, uh, they were concentrated not just in, the, in budget time, in the three months, uh, basically, where the budget is discussed uh, by parliament, but over the whole year. And that made a, a very important uh, difference. Uh, so, I mean, that's uh, why uh, I think that the, the, I take this uh, very uh, personally, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to work on these issues from international organizations, mm -hmm. uh, first with uh, an Inter-American Development Bank, then with the OECD, and now with the World Bank. Um, so, uh, I think that uh, looking at that, at, at these uh, last uh, few years, what I, I can say is that uh, uh, one of the most important things that development uh, partners can do for uh, 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 transparent uh, uh, budgeting uh, is uh, to uh, publish data to provide feedback to countries. 
because uh, budgeting is a uh, part of that invisible side of uh, development, which is institutions and governance. Uh, with institutions and governance, you cannot see or touch that in the same way that you see a highway or you see a school or you see a hospital. So the only way of getting a sense of how much progress or not countries are making is precisely by generating uh, information like the one that uh, we're discussing uh, today. Uh, the World Bank uh, has uh, supported these initiatives, but also works on, on PIFA assessments. We have also partnered with the, with the OECD on their survey of uh, budgeting institutions. Uh, we, are, we work with the IMF uh, now in the uh, assessments based on their uh, new or updated uh, fiscal transparency code and with a gift that developed the high-level principles on, budget, uh, on budgeting. Um, so I think that that feedback is very important for people that work, uh, that are in government, that are in parliaments, and make decisions that have to do with uh, budgeting. Um, probably uh, this uh, would be even more effective if we could be successful in drawing attention from uh, the agencies and the investors that uh, look at the risks that they face uh, in countries uh, when they assess uh, institutions in countries. Because uh, open and participatory budgets are a, a very important element of uh, sustainability of uh, good uh, fiscal policy over time. Um, so that uh, could also help build more awareness of the importance of uh, these issues. And then when it comes to uh, support countries, I would say that the first uh, thing to do, the first challenge for, uh, the, uh, for international organizations is uh, to help countries organize their strategies to address the bottlenecks or challenges that they face. And I emphasize strategies because this is not a, a, a short-term task. This is not something that gets solved in one, two, three, five years or the period of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, an administration. It takes longer and therefore the sequencing and the way different uh, uh, steps are articulated make a very important uh, difference. Uh, second, uh, I think that uh, uh, it's very important that we are able to support countries that have different uh, needs. And I think that the, the survey now it's very, it's very clear in the sense that when you look at the three uh, pillars of, uh, of budget uh, transparency, you see that uh, uh, some countries are strong in one pillar, but maybe weak in another. And there are very few, I think it was uh, only four, that are strong or rate uh, well in the, in the, in the three uh, pillars of, the, of this survey. So to do that, we need a broad set of, uh, of uh, uh, cooperation tools. For us as a bank, we cannot rely only upon loans because not all, all uh, developing and emerging countries need the loans. So it is important that we can also work uh, through technical assistance, that uh, we also uh, can uh, provide uh, services that the countries pay for through, through reimbursable uh, advisory services, uh, and that uh, we work also at the, at the regional and uh, at, the, at, the work, at, at the level of networks of policymakers. So it is, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, this, it's very good that the, the World Bank has uh, broadened its, uh, its toolbox in order to work uh, through these different uh, 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 channels and then to be able to work with countries with different uh, levels of development, with different uh, needs, but uh, that all of them face some challenge uh, dealing with budgeting. And finally, I would say that, uh, uh, that it is important in this uh, cooperation with uh, countries to broaden the perspective. Uh, here at the World Bank, we started dealing with the uh, budgets basically from the fiscal side, and that reflected very much the structure that we had uh, a few years ago. But uh, now, uh, uh, now that uh, this uh, global practice on governance has uh, been created, uh, we, put, uh, we pulled together a number of different units, people that were working on different areas related to governance. So now we can build the bridge between the fiscal side of budgeting, uh, the auditing, the procurement, and the citizen engagement. And I think that's a very important uh, step in terms of uh, responding really to the needs of the countries. 
And the final uh, message that I would uh, like to give here is that uh, no matter how much people know about budgeting or no matter how much they have written about budgeting from international organizations or from uh, academia, but budget people are very concrete and pragmatic uh, people and they need hands-on experience to be brought to them. Uh, I cannot emphasize more that uh, uh, budget uh, specialists across the world are very similar to one another. Uh, there are similar personalities, similar concerns, similar limitations. So uh, they listen more when they see a peer that has done something, that has achieved something uh, within their own, uh, as part of their own culture, as part of their own community. So I think that uh, this issue of uh, bringing hands-on experience, people that have done things uh, under conditions that are not that different from those that are uh, faced by, uh, by uh, uh, our clients, I think is uh, another element of uh, how to be more effective in this uh, field and make not only uh, uh, progress in the way that we are seeing today, but to sustain this over time uh, in order to address uh, some of the important gaps that still remain that we see as uh, uh, reflected in this uh, survey of 2015. Thank you. I do want to leave time so that you've got the chance to, to question the panelists, but there is someone else we need to introduce. Oxfam started as a, a famine relief operation back in Oxford, where the ox comes from, uh, way back in the 1960s. It's now grown into a global non-government organization which campaigns to right the wrongs of poverty, hunger, and injustice. Uh, with us today is Paul O'Brien, who's the Vice President for Policy and Advocacy of Oxfam America, and will tell us uh, how the NGOs fit into this equation. Paul. I thought you signaled me that by standing up you'd cut the introduction short, but that was pretty short. <laughs> um, so it's great to be here, great to have heard uh, the array of views. I'll try and draw on some of those. I just want to share three uh, provocations with you observations around why this is a really important uh, launch moment, uh, why it's important for those of us who engage in trying to influence, shape uh, broader conversations around how information, power, politics, and strengthening institutions come together. So that's what I'm going to try and do. Okay, uh, these are three little epiphanies that I've had this year. Most of them have been a little bit sort of uh, uh, shocking or worrying for me, but uh, one of the positives uh, that I took from those epiphanies was the relevance of this kind of data and the work that IBP is doing. So let me, no more prevarication, here we go. The first, the first provocation was, I read a book early in the year. We have a fairly large policy and advocacy shop doing campaigning in the United States uh, and trying to help the US be as influential in a positive way as possible in the world where it has so much power. And I read this book and the book basically said, the book by the way was called Policy, uh, Lobbying and Policy Change, Who Wins, Who Loses and Why? something like that. I know it's policy and lobbying. They did this uh, empirical quantitative analysis of how much policy got changed in Washington. Um, and the short answer was very little. The majority of major efforts to improve US policy, either at the executive or legislative level, particularly at the legislative level, very little happens. The majority of efforts in reform uh, fail, and 19 out of 20 times it doesn't matter how much money you throw at it. You need a whole bunch of things. In, in one sense, there's not a lot of elasticity in this mature political market for reasons we can all go on at length about, entrenched interests and so on. So I picked up the IBP index from the previous time, 2012, and I, I took, because it was an index, there's a, there's a half dozen of them that are developmental but that measure the United States and measure many other countries around the world. And I asked myself, where is the action? And we did this little analysis of which are the big movers and which are the, the, the po positively or negatively in the IBP index the last time. And what we found in that index, along with a bunch of other indexes, Transparency Internationals, Corruption Indexes, um, Freedom House Indexes, is pretty much the same story all the time. 
which is that in the OECD countries, the mature polities and economies, there's not a lot of change happening. It's pretty static. Even though you, we make a lot of noise about European shifts in power and politics, even though we get lost in our own melodrama that's going on right now in presidential politics, there's actually not a lot happening. Whereas there's huge amounts happening in many emerging economies and developing countries. So took a look again this year, big movers and shakers, who's moving the, in the best directions? There's no mature democracies on there. It's Benin, Zambia, the Kyrgyz Republic, Cameroon, Senegal. It's countries like the Philippines that are moving. Who's getting worse? Again, it's not the mature economies and polities. It's Afghanistan, Nepal, India, Venezuela, and Lebanon. So the first big aha I had this year, if you're working in social change work, the action may not be happening here in a meaningful way anymore. Certainly not if you're talking about shifting the US just as the US. Meaning, if you recognize with some humility that if you're in the business of trying to improve systems and institutions, there's much more elasticity for better or worse out there. Maybe the only way to show up in the United States is what is the level of influence that the US has over increasing positive trends in other contexts rather than um, uh, just working here. Now, that is not to say we need to close up shop in the United States. It is great to see an index uh, on a global standard in which the US is one of the four countries out of the, the 102 uh, that is considered to have an open budget. We don't do that well on a lot of these global indexes at the moment. Um, it would be great to see the US government implement. Uh, we, Oxfam had to sue the, uh, this administration on a transparency issue to get them to, to pass a good rule uh, under 1504 in Dodd-Frank. We just won that case a couple of weeks ago, and we want to see this administration put a new rule in place that opens up extractives revenue so that it can go on budget. So it's not to say there's nothing happening here. But that example is a classic case of what is happening. It's the ability to use our economic and political power to influence transparency in the rest of the world that may be most important. So that was, for me, the first um, big question. The second, let me just share one other. Uh, um, the second big question is, OK, so the movement may be happening elsewhere. What do we do about it? Um, Oxfam has recognized that we've been, correct history, we've been an organization that grew out of trying to change developed polities to be better actors in the world. It's where the charity uh, uh, story uh, drove a lot of additional aid investments uh, and so on. It's where we we drew on um, the philanthropic instincts of governments and uh, hum humanitarian instincts of people to change. But what we've had to recognize this year is two big shifts in the SDG conversation. I agree with everything that Daniela said. But if there's one takeaway that I took from Addis Ababa, where the development financing conversation was, it's a profound shift is going on, and we're not ready for it. The first part of that shift is that the action isn't aid anymore. What developing countries wanted to talk about was tax. They, the aid was the big loser in Addis, not because the numbers went down, but because nobody was debating it. It was like, oh, we'll get what we get. Uh, maybe we'll get 0.7 from some countries to recommit, but oh, God, that, I'm boring myself. That's what was going on. Meanwhile, and it wasn't a great outcome in terms of tax, there was a raging debate over a bloody UN tax committee for three days in Addis because developing countries were not going to lie down and be told what to think about their domestic revenues. They want better governance of, their, uh, of public revenues, and they want the global system to stop taking revenues out of their countries rather than leaving it where value is created. So they just wanted to talk about tax. So my big uh, epiphany this year is that we are in this moment of change where the action and development is moving from traditional OECD countries to these developing countries who have to choose how to spend their budgets. And it's moving from aid and ODA to um, public finance management and, not, and domestic resource mobilization and so on. That takes me to the last observation I want to make um, about the sort of epiphany that, that or epiphany or, or a realization, shocking realization about 
where we are as civil society organizations. Even if we recognize in time that the action is happening in national and subnational budgets of developing countries, even if we recognize and reallocate our resources, I'm not sure that we collectively, either technocratically or politically, are ready for the next game in town. Because this isn't a technocratic exercise in the end of the day. It's a marriage of better technology, better data, better information in politics. And everybody's playing it. So my question is whether we're going to be able to show up in developing countries which may be falling or gaining on the index and whether we're going to be able to play a relevant role because we understand the marriage of the, the information that's coming out of this index with a few other things. What you heard today, Indonesia, Chile, um, the Philippines, are stories of sophisticated politicians, former politicians, understanding the political power of financial information and building a franchise off it. But they, those politicians who want to do open budgets and expenditure accountability and deliver information about what's being spent and where is it going, they are in a never-ending constant battle in their own countries around political power and where it comes from. And there's only a part of that constituency that gains from everything that we're talking about today. Those who gain political power by providing social services and being open and being accountable to their people. That's how they get voted in. That's how they stay in power. It's how they build a franchise. On the other side of it are countries and actors within those countries who gain their power in very different ways. And if we sterilize our own analysis of that context, we're not going to be useful to these developed crats these technically sophisticated politicians who gain political power through providing information. So what I think is going to be really interesting and a challenge for us, and I'm not sure that we're ready, because many of us, Oxfam, for example, comes out of a humanitarian history which said, oh, no, we don't do politics. We just sit in between hostile political parties and provide goods and services to the most needy. If we claim to have no politics, no understanding of people's political agendas, we're not going to be that useful in these political battles that are coming. The optimist in me says, 20 years from now, this period of transition will be over. We will have politically relevant data in the hands of citizens who will get stuff they care about, not theoretical national budget stuff, but real, live, timely data about how their subnational administration promised to deliver them a school at the cost of $40,000 or whatever it was. 40000 It was in Afghanistan. It was $40,000 to build a schoolroom. Um, if it was done by the government, um, at the cost of $5 per person. It's four weeks behind. Here's the picture of the individual who's responsible. Here's what you can do. It will all have become more meaningful 20 years from now. Data, politics, power, and, uh, and public accountability will have come together. But we're in this transition phase now where we've got some data emerging. We've got these great indexes. We've got civil society beginning to realize it's got a new role to play. We've got everybody playing this game. And we don't know where the winners are going to be, where the trendsetters are going to be. So my epiphany on this last one for this year is we've got to make really smart bets on a few countries that are showing real leadership in a few sectors that will redefine the rules of the game for everyone else because they'll gain political power, they'll gain international fi finance public, they'll gain private sector investment, and they will be the winners. And we've got to bet on them. And we've got to not be fooled by those who understand the rules of the game but don't actually plan to play it. They are, they are there to use this reality to gain a different kind of power. And our ability to know the difference is going to be the determinant of how quickly we get to that point in time where real power is democratized with everything that IBP and others are doing. Thank you. Uh, we are very shortly going to open the floor up uh, to questions to all our panelists. Before we do, Warren, I'd like you to grab the microphone. I know you're uh, not planning to, to make an address, but as executive director of the IBP, the reason we're here, uh, do you feel things are better, are getting better? You took an extra year to improve the model, to improve uh, how you measure transparency. Do you think things are getting better? So, is this on? Hello? Yeah. Here we go. Okay. 
Um, so as, as, as the head of IBP, I think what I want to say is I agree with everything Vivek said <laughs> and his colleagues. Um, <clears throat> but I was just reflecting, listening to everybody here, a, a story that surfaced a couple of days ago in, in South Africa in work that we're involved with in with um, a, a social movement, a budding social movement in Cape Town called the Social Justice Coalition. And we're supporting them in a fight to get the Cape Town municipality in, the so in supposedly a progressive city to provide, astonishingly, decent sanitation facilities for people, marginalized poor people that live in South Africa in Cape Town's townships. And it's a very, very hard struggle. And um, <clears throat> the other day, after really admonishing the Cape Town City Council very, very strongly, one of the lead councillors, the chair of a committee, thought in an address he was really going to stick it to the Social Justice Coalition. He was going to find the, the deepest knife that he could and inflict the deepest wound. And so what he said in his address is that SJC, the Social Justice Coalition, is obsessed with budgets. They can't get out of this budget frame. And of course, my colleagues in SJC thought this was the biggest compliment they've ever had. Because finally, they've been recognized as individuals that are not just community members, but they have value added. They have a very critical role to play in the budget process. And so they responded by taking that, that statement, the SJC is obsessed by budgets, and plastering it on T-shirts and hats and banners and any, anywhere that they could. So it, it's great in this discussion to find a way to recognize the centrality of budgets. And I'm just going to, I think it's important that we get to questions, so I'm just going to make three points on messages that I think are underlying the survey that might be good to bring to the surface. And the first one is to answer Alan's question is, yes, we're making progress. And it's important to recognize that progress. It's very important, it's vital to recognize those countries, as Paul was saying, that's, that's, at, the leading, that's at the leading edge of this change. Innovation and excellence is everywhere these days. This isn't the 1960s and 70s anymore. But it's also important in the survey, as Vivek said, to not get too excited. There's some very serious blockages. And the slope, while it's upward, is, is very gentle, to put it, to put it politely. Um, the blockages, particularly in that middle group of countries, any country can get now, we know, at relatively low cost and capacity from 0 to 40. How do you get beyond the 60? And why are countries getting stuck there? And it might be a capacity issue, but our hunch is it's a political issue as well. There's something about the type of data that you need to produce when you go from 40 to 60 that, that's a political decision that's not required in going from 0 to 40. And so we need to think very, very hard about that. And the, the second issue that comes across in this survey for the first time is the lack of sustainability in gains. So many countries, the volatility, the story that Vivek told about Ghana is illustrative. If you're a civil society organization, or you're a legislator, or even you're in the government, how do you monitor government, a, a document that's there and then it disappears and then it's produced and then it's not produced? It's impossible. So sustainability is something we really need to think about. So that's point number one. Point number two is um, a data revolution is a brilliant idea. We're so in favor of it, we can't wait for it to happen. It's an essential condition of both achieving the, the SDGs and learning about what works and doesn't work, and we missed that terribly. We missed a huge opportunity in the MDGs to understand that. Uh, but that's not going to be enough. So we really need to continue to focus on transparency and good, honest data, but we have to be able to simultaneously put our attention towards participation of civil society and the strength and independence of legislatures and supreme audit institutions. Because what we're building here is not just data and use to, you, we need an ecosystem of institutions that can use that data to ensure that they hold their governments accountable and even more they can act as critical allies of, of, of this SDG effort. So that ecosystem, thinking about how you build ecosystems is is a really, really important issue for, for the SDGs. And then um, the, the, the final point is, I guess just to make the point that's underlying a lot of what we're saying, there's a tremendous, tremendous urgency in this issue. 
We're about to sign the MDGs. We're about to sign the COP declaration. It's happening in a couple of months. And as the index shows, we're nowhere close to the kind of data that we need today that we need in a couple of months' time. So it's really, it's beyond a talking issue now. And it's beyond an issue that can be resolved by any one of the institutions around the table, whether it be government, civil society, legislatures, or auditors. There has to be a partnership here. There has to be a collective effort to make sure that this gentle slope in improvement in data, transparency, governance, budget governance, is a much steeper curve. And we're only going to do that by thinking very hard together and putting collective pressure in the north and the south across the this, this set of ecosystems to make sure that we make a real difference on time for the SDGs. Thanks, Warren. If you do have questions, please line up in front of the microphone and we can direct them to whoever uh, you want to speak to. Uh, while we're waiting for you to form the question in your head, let's go back, if we can, to the Philippines and if we can call up also Pretoria on our video link. Hopefully both gentlemen are still there. Yes, I am. Fantastic. It's Neil Cole here. Hi, Neil. Secretary Abad, are you still with us? Yes, yes, I'm still here. Terrific. One question I, I wanted to ask you. Clearly, there has been an improvement uh, in the Philippines. Uh, do you think then that that builds public trust uh, in the institutions of government, in the government itself? And does that also improve uh, private sector confidence so they're willing to invest in the country, take money to the country, and perhaps improve the conditions for workers in the country? Well, I'll tell you, in a, in a few months, in about uh, eight months, President Aquino is going to leave office and he's going to be the most accomplished and the most trustworthy president we've ever had post martial law. And a lot of that really has been his faithfulness to the social contract that he made in 2010. And because of a national popular draft, they chose him to run for president and eventually was elected in an unprecedented way that's been able to govern in a way very closely in touch with our people. I was sufficiently provoked by the uh, statements from uh, our colleague from uh, Oxfam, because I truly agree with him about the centrality of uh, politics, and I don't mean partisan politics, but the use of power in uh, promoting uh, the common good, especially for uh, for the poor. Uh, you know, we have uh, experimented on uh, what we call the bottom-up uh, budgeting uh, uh, approach in uh, budget preparation and budget uh, execution. And I tell you, just the mere fact that people have access to participation in the budget process and being able to influence the menu of choices for the application of budget is already very empowering for many people. What more if they can participate all the way to budget execution and budget accountability? So I think, uh, especially in uh, cultures where, in political cultures where patronage, patronage continues to dominate, as in, uh, in our legislature, where you know the culture breeds. Uh, uh, of poverty and dependency, you know, the budget, the process of involving citizens in the budget process is an empowering process. And I think if they can continue to do that so that they can influence their representatives in Congress, then we will be able to see uh, greater improvements in the uh, ability of Congress to open itself up to greater uh, participation and greater openness. Because right now, if we look at our uh, our ratings in the uh, open budget survey, our our legislature ranked lowest, about uh, 32 points, and simply because of uh, you know the inability of uh, the legislature focused primarily on constituency services in exercising its uh, oversight role. So I really think inherent in this exercise really is the realization, the application of uh, power, the power of the citizenry to influence you know, the use of uh, public funds. And, and uh, that's really, I think, a very provocative, yet very essential to this whole discussion of open budget. 
Thank you. There are people ready to ask questions. Sorry, this is, it's, it, it, this is going to be on my tombstone. Just one more question. I have one very quick question uh, to Mr Cole. Mr Cole, how do you create the environment where governments are willing to open up their budgets to civil society and to the public so they can analyse what is going on in their name? Thank you very much. Um, but I, I think it's about making making that important link um, between development and the need for better information. Um, and, and I want to come back to this point on that Warren also emphasised on on the threshold effect, um, whether that is a, a a technical as well as as a political will issue. I mean, I certainly agree that that it is that it is both. And I think once we start making the, the case that development does need um, good data, um, not only for the decisions that the governments take, but also where citizens are able to determine whether that government in power is in fact delivering on, on its promises. And the best way to, 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 to determine that is whether the schools are being built, um, whether the health services are being are being provided, um, and 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 where you are able to make um, those connections um, um, for and and show governments um, that um, that this data, in fact, um, by by making it available, not only in terms of the promises that that you set out in your budget, but also in terms of showing that you have delivered against those promises, that is what um, you know keeps you in power. Which I suppose comes to a point that 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 Paul made, um, but it also it it also starts to starts to to show government that um, that progress is is an important is an important. Um, 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 thing that 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 allows that um, that 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 government to meet its 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 objectives that it has set, and also ensures that they that they do remain re remain in power, uh, provided that um, that they don't also exceed the periods that they allowed to be in power. Thank you very Thanks. much. We have questions from the floor. If I can ask you to identify yourself, if you'd like Yaya. to direct your question to someone particularly, and then give us your question. My name is Yaya Fanusi. Usually, I, with the United States of Africa 2017 project, I usually do not ask a question. I usually look for a gap in the presentation. First of all, thank you very much for you guys do, executing which we were, what we were advocating in the 60s and early 70s. I assume that you study go governmental accounting, fund accounting. So I would suggest, beside publishing the allocation and disbursement of the funds, you need to get them to publish the details, that is, which staff are working on it, which trucks were bought from that fund, and are they working on that project? Because sometimes they divert the fund, not because of fraud and the they would divert a specialized fund into a general fund activities to suspend the I work for the state government of California for, for 30 years, and I also was in the Department of Finance. I predicted whatever happened with Aaron. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dan Dudas. I'm with Transparency International USA. I guess my question is, is mostly directed towards um, our representatives from the International Budget Partnership. I just had it's sort of, I guess, a bit of a maybe a methodology question. Um, one of the things that really jumped out at me when I looked at the the ranking was that Russia scores quite highly. And so I was curious to know when we're talking about, you know, it looks like the transparency score is based on our documents published. Do the researchers look into the accuracy of the information and the data in those published documents? I think, you know, from Transparency, Transparency International's perspective, you know, there are all these questions about how was the money spent on Sochi, how much money was spent on Sochi. It seems like Russia is also in a lot of ways, a black box in terms of where the money went. And so, you know, to sort of use an analogy from Russian history, you know, are these just Potemkin documents? Um, or, because anyone can publish documents, but I think the real issue is what's the accuracy? And I don't want to just pick on Russia. We've looked at, and so have many other organizations, looked at U.S. budget transparency. 
And so the US website, usaspending.gov, in fact, when people have looked at it, they found that a lot of the information is either inaccurate or not particularly timely or missing. So I, I think from the transparency perspective, it would be really interesting to know how much of an effort is made to ensure that the documents that are published, in fact, include accurate data. Warren, I think that's one for you. Do you want to? Um, can, I, can I add to this? I think so. The, the aim that we, what we try to do with this index when we set it up was to focus on developing an index that was comparative, um, it could be regular, um, and it was fact based. So, as a methodology, that's where we try to focus our attention. And that implied certain advantages and it implies certain disadvantages in terms of what's not covered in the index. And you're right, there are three big issues which are not covered in the index um, sufficiently. Um, the one is off-budget data, so off-budget enterprises, quasi-fiscal activities, those types of practices which Russia maybe has some comparative advantage in. So that's missing. The second big gap is around subnational data. It's a national index to the extent that subnational data is captured in national documentation. Um, we capture it to the extent that it's not, we don't capture that. And the third issue is quality. And we're very concerned with quality. Um, the partners that we work with around the world have a lot to say and are very vigorous in pushing the governments to put out quality data. But that's not something that you can cover in an index which is comparative, regular, um, and fact-based. There's, there's no way to look at that. So those are that's the strength of the index, is it is comparative. It's the only comparative index in data that we've got around the world. The weaknesses, if you like, is that the, it doesn't cover the next generation of problems, which is around quality. Thank you for your patience. Your, your yes. question. Yes, good morning. My name is Dorothea Malloy. I work for the United States Agency for International Development. I'm in the CFO office. And my question is to Paul from Oxfam. You mentioned the tax discussion going on in Addis uh, recently. As we know, we have here in the United States the most progressive tax system. Most other countries rely on the value-added tax, essentially a national sales tax. Can you provide just further comments on the discussion around tax and maybe your thoughts Thoughts on it also? Thank you. I go? Yeah, okay. please grab the microphone. If I can say that and then segue to a little comment to the other. So, yes, uh, um, I think the US is a very important player on tax. I'm not sure we have the most progressive tax system, but I do think uh, what the recognition was in Addis was that the big money, the $9 trillion that has grown in emerging economy budgets, is coming from both external investment but also domestic economic activity. So that, so what, what everybody collectively realized at the financing conference was that the finance actually now sits in the potential tax base and could we distribute it. So the US played a very useful role at one level and a very unuseful role at another. another. It did a good thing by launching the Addis Tax Initiative and by launching the data revolution to say what we've got to do is we've got to get more information about financing out there and we've got to help d uh, developing countries build up their tax systems. So that's cool. What it resisted was the idea that countries should regulate uh, corporations, particularly US corporations, to make sure that more of the economic value that is created in countries stays there. They wanted to help. I talked to Secretary Liu, who said, it's very difficult for me. I've got conservative members of Congress saying you're going to kill American business if you don't let them use tax havens and tax law to make the most profits they can because they're competing with the Chinese. And I said to Secretary Liu, so, so what you're telling me, Mr. Secretary, is you want American companies to succeed by having the best tax lawyers and the best accountants, not the best products. What the United States should be fighting for is an even playing field and a well-regulated marketplace where the best entrepreneurs win, not the best accountants and lawyers. And that allows me to segue a little bit to just the comment on um, Transparency International's comment and to have a little dig at the bank because I know there's some people who influence the bank here or you work at the bank. Um, and thank you for hosting us, by the way. You're very important <laughs> in the conversation. But here's the thing. The bank has been pretending for years that development or underdevelopment is an exclusively technocratic problem which they can bring the expertise to solve. 
It is, of course, the marriage of technical problems, innovation and, and, and expertise, and politics. So when Oxfam launches a global inequality campaign, the World Bank informally tells us, I don't know why you feel it's necessary to attack the rich and powerful. Why is that getting us anywhere? And what we say back to them is, listen, you've just said, your president says that inequality is a huge problem, and you said you're going to lift up the bottom 40%. Unless you're going to infinitely grow the pie, we're going to have to catch up in the regulation of where all the other money is if you're going to help that 40%. The fact is, there's enough money out there. There's $9 trillion, but where is it sitting? It's sitting in secret places held by too few people in under-regulated ways. They're not evil. They're just doing what people do when nobody regulates them. And the bank has to step up to that political reality. So you have a doing business index that rewards companies or countries, sorry, countries, for allowing a small tax base which lets people remove the money from the countries. If you have a low tax rate and you let people do tax avoidance, you get a great score from the World Bank for helping business work. It's craziness. So what I would propose to Transparency International, to IBP and to the World Bank is come up with an index about better politics, better developmental politics, which marries what transparency is. Because you're right, it's a marriage of both things. How can Russia score so well on these issues? There's a whole range of measures around transparency, civil society openness, genuine accountability, budget openness, corruption, that the bank should be bringing together in a, we all know it's a political agenda, but they have the ability to say, no, this is just about data measure countries against each other, and get us having a serious conversation so we can say, just like they do with doing business, they're the guys who are doing developmental politics. They're the guys who are democratizing information and making sure that their people get services. If the bank started measuring that, they could do it without ever using those awkward words about elites and power and stuff, but they do more to change the politics of the conversation than many of the rest of us do through campaigning. So there's your provocation. The thought that went through my head is, well, you invited him, so <laughs> <laughs> miss your question. Good morning. Faustine Mabira with Bread for the World. Thanks, Paul, for anticipating my question. So actually, I think I have to think of a new question. I was actually going to ask IBP whether you've thought about um, ways to you know, enforce transparency accountability beyond government budgets, because as Paul and Daniela mentioned, the SDGs are c bringing along this transformative shift in, you know, where finance is coming from. So I think besides the government budgets, how is your initiative going to enforce transparency accountability, especially the resources coming from private um, sources? Um, and also just very briefly to uh, the panel, I'm just always curious, every time we have a problem with political will, it seems like that's where everything gets stuck. Like, what do you do when there's no political will? Is political will that biggest problem that we've ever faced in human development. It's just, I think it's a, it's a way that lets governments or several actors off the hook, because the moment somebody says, I mean, government ministers are happy to sit on the panel and say, there's no political will. So what do we do about that? Thanks. Anyone want to take that one? I've spoken a lot, but I'm gonna say one sentence. Reward the winners and punish the losers. Make make performance politically relevant. Uh, Mario, one question I want to ask you is, we talk about how budgets can be transparent, how the public will pour through them. We even heard from Sri saying that journalists and civil society and the public, when they'll go through the budgets, they don't understand them. And I've seen budgets, and I'm fairly educated, and I don't get it all the time. How do we go about making budgets more open, more transparent, more understandable to ordinary people so they can go through it almost line by line and say, hold on a second, that doesn't add up. Because until that happens, it's going to be very easy to obfuscate a lot of what's going on with some national budgets. Yes, uh, <clears throat> Alan, thank you very much for that uh, question. Uh, part of uh, my story with uh, budgets is that uh, when I became a budget director, I pulled out a, 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 su a supplement from The Guardian from the time when I was uh, studying in, in Britain uh, that was the supplement for the budget. Uh, 
And I said, uh, I mean, this was a 20 page uh, supplement. So I said, I mean, I would like to see this in Chile. Now that's not uh, something very easy to achieve. Uh, and uh, there's still no full supplements uh, discussing the budget. But, uh, but the, the point that I'm trying to make is that, uh, is that uh, uh, making budgets matter uh, is, is the first step uh, to make uh, uh, budgets more participatory and people taking a, a <coughs> more interest in them. And I would argue that this is uh, something that is very strategic also for people that sit in finance ministries. My own experience is that, uh, I mean, yes, uh, the finance ministry in my country had a lot of power. The budget office <coughs> had a lot of power on, over the deciding and shaping a budget uh, proposal. But at some point, I asked myself, uh, OK, what is the value in keeping all this to ourselves? Um, I, I, I'm I really doing my job by trying to keep this discussion or, uh, ordered and organized within these four walls. Uh, wouldn't it be better? if people understood the kind of choices that you had to make in a budget? Wouldn't it be uh, better if uh, people could understand the structure of a budget and why you're making policy, fiscal policy in one way or another? And uh, my response was that, uh, yes, I mean, you can do a better job from a finance ministry if you can share with the citizens, with the stakeholders, some of the uh, trade-offs, some of the difficult decisions that you have to make. Of course, it's very difficult to bring that into a fully participatory process uh, you, uh, 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 away from, uh, from uh, Congress. Uh, because, uh, I mean, the economic theory has dealt with this uh, for many years. There you have the arrows in possibility theorem, and you have the difficulty, I mean, the, this issue of uh, common pool problems. So, I mean, you cannot translate that one to one, but uh, you have to start from there. And uh, once you do that, I think it, everything else is much easier to do. Now, let me uh, link this with another feature. Budgets have a very special uh, characteristic. They are routines. They happen every year. They involve every year, more or less uh, a, a similar set of factors. And what you do in one year is not independent from what happened the past year and what will happen the next year. So uh, routines, if you look at them from, a, let's say, a game theory perspective, if you are able to move those routines in a certain way, you can make much more lasting change than if you just make a, a punctual uh, reform. So uh, that uh, takes me to what I feel it's important to make uh, changes sustainable, the point that uh, you were making on budgeting. I think that if, uh, as long as you uh, work on budget transparency on the sidelines of the budget or at an, at an individual stage, maybe you will not get very far. You have to enter the decision-making process and uh, see what can you improve there to make it consistent with what you're trying to do in terms of being more transparent, more participatory, more efficient, and so on. You have to enter the core of budgeting. And unfortunately, many countries uh, actually work a lot on the sidelines. Many countries, uh, for instance, uh, publish uh, performance indicators. Uh, many countries uh, publish a thick uh, document with uh, budget data. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but that doesn't take you very far. Uh, so if you have a, a view of a budget as a cycle composed of a number of stages at each of which you can do something in terms of a transparency and participation, you will get more lasting change. Uh, uh, and uh, I think working on what glues one, uh, one stage to another, I think is particularly important. In my experience, what, what was especially important was that when we took a, a budget to Congress, members of parliament raised a number of issues that had to do with transparency, effectiveness, and so on. But you couldn't always resolve everything 
in those three months of budget discussion. So what we created was what we call a, a, a budget protocol, where we recorded many of these issues and transformed them into commitments of the government in terms of what to do in the next budget or what to do across the fiscal year to make sure that the next budget would be better. And finally, I cannot uh, avoid uh, uh, responding to Paul's uh, comments on the <laughs> World Bank, because I'm the World Bank representative in this panel. Uh, so uh, I have some uh, good news for you. Uh, first of all, uh, we are working with, uh, with uh, doing business people uh, to build a similar, uh, similar indices on uh, being a citizen. All right. Uh, second, uh, we had a, a, a Secretary Abad here. Uh, we have been working with, uh, with the government of the Philippines over the last uh, few months uh, on a project that enters very much on this uh, difficult uh, uh, political field. Of course, we're not getting into uh, party politics or, uh, polit politics or anything like that. But the, what we're trying to do is uh, to help build a coalition for change in governance in the Philippines. The Philippines is a country that it has been very volatile in terms of, uh, of uh, public policies. Uh, so the, uh, the uh, political cycle that will uh, soon uh, uh, lead uh, to a new election and that will bring a new government uh, risks uh, the possibility of uh, you know, keeping what has been done well and building upon that. So we are working with, uh, with uh, Minister Abad and a number of other authorities there in that sense. So what we are doing is to, uh, uh, is to support dialogue with the uh, communities, with the stakeholders across the political spectrum to build this coalition for governance change. Now, this is innovative. I cannot claim that this is the core or the, or the bulk of what the uh, World Bank does. But uh, I think that uh, it's interesting. I mean, this, in the same way that we say that uh, developing countries may be doing more changes uh, in uh, budgeting than uh, rich countries, I think that it's important also to look at the new things that the World Bank or other institutions are doing uh, uh, above what was traditionally done in the past. Thank you. I will get to your question, so I'll ask for your patience. But, Danielle, we have the graphic up. Would you like to talk us through it very quickly? One, just one moment, and actually, it's, um, there was a click through. It looks like happened. This happens to be my eight year old daughter's favorite goal, because she said, if you solve this, you solve all of them. But there are, <laughs> which is goal 10, reduce inequalities. But here's all 17. So I think it's just helpful, and maybe I'll just make one point related. So th this lays out the 17 goals that are going to be adopted at the summit. Um, uh, at the end of September on sustainable development. Uh, so the top is more, uh, covers many of what was in the Millennium Development Goals, health, education, et cetera. A stronger gender equality goal here. Then we get into a lot of economic oriented goals, energy, infrastructure, uh, and then uh, environmental sustainability related like oceans, um, forests, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, I'll just make one point that relates to this and to the question that was asked, which is there's quite a it's quite extraordinary what's happening in terms of the ability to visualize, use data, and link multiple types of data sets to gain insights. And you're seeing that a great example of that um, is in uh, what's called Global Forest Watch, um, which if any of you have seen, is basically taking what was publicly released around 2009 by the US government, Geo, uh, Landstat, which is our geospatial data, was used then, it, it was publicly released, it's used by data scientists and environmental advocates paired with computing power from Google and others, but not much money, um, to basically real time now track deforestation across the globe. You can see real time where that's happening. You can imagine overlaying that with budget data, overlaying that with other data. And so that ability to now take multiple data sources and the kind of collaborations that are just starting to happen between data scientists, visuals, those who can do visualizations, and those who hold the data and really want to cha uh, make change uh, is, a, I think, a huge potential here. Sir, your question. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Yannick Morgan, and I'm from PricewaterhouseCoopers, the um, International Anti-Corruption Unit there. 
Um, my question is also uh, uh, for the gentleman from Oxfam. Um, I was sufficiently provoked, um, so I had to get out of my seat. Uh, first, I wanted to say on your first provocation um, that it's not that nothing's happening in the US. It's just nothing happening interesting on the national level. If you go to state and local levels, I think you're going to see a lot more interesting movement in budgets. Um, my second question, which is more to the substance of this panel, um, it's my sort of, on a philosophical level, it's my sort of belief, understanding that um, we'd much rather invest in the systems than invest in the politics, because if we are able to ensure that there are, that there's open transparency, um, that, that um, the publication of information is accurate, um, and that there are tools for, um, for people uh, to act on that information, but we'd much rather use that tool uh, to increase democracy and to increase um, people coming up together rather than betting on people who, just for this limited amount of time, as you, as you pointed out, have um, the uh, ability to benefit from this political moment. Um, and so trying to find the people who really mean it, which will definitely change over time within people and within um, countries, uh, seems like, uh, yes, understanding politics is important in that way, but it seems like a much more sustainable um, endeavor to invest in the people and the increased democratization and spread of information, of accurate, actionable information. Oh, yep. So I'm sufficiently provoked in reverse, but won't go on at length. I will just say this. Uh, I think it's a fair comment. I'd love to debate it long, but w what comes to mind is transition management. If you are in a period of mass uncertainty about the rules of the game as an institution or even as a person, but let's think just in terms of institutions and systems, what every trans transition management book says is don't be a victim of change, be an agent of change. And my comment to you is that we've been trying to do sort of steady state institutional investment in the development profession for the last half century. But we are in a profound moment of change in power and who has money that's going on now and data and how it's used. Like we all kind of can imagine how data, power, money, voice, citizenship will come together in 30 years. Warren's data will be, you know, 10-year-olds will be able to look at it and say, oh, yeah, they did it finally at the sub-national level or at the municipal level. And actually, that matters because now my school teacher is going to show up or my mother's going to get health care, whatever it is. We know it's coming. But we're in this period of complete flux right now because we have lots of data. It's disorganized. We have institutions that don't know whether it's relevant. We've got development actors who don't know how to play. And my point is, in a period of transition, if you want to avoid being a victim, then decide who the agents are and try to be an agent yourself. So I take your point that these leaders, these developocratic leaders are temporary. Ashraf Ghani, I worked for him in Afghanistan. He got political power against a bunch of warlords by offering social services to his people. First time in Afghanistan's written history that somebody got up there and got power by saying, I'll give you healthcare and education and transparency. He'll probably be gone in three or four years because of the dynamics of Afghanistan, hopefully gone in a political way. But the fact is, we have a question, do we bet? I mean, I don't want him gone, I want him there, but if he has to go, I don't want it to be any other way than politics. Um, if, if we have to make a bet on a very transitional environment, do we sort of focus on Afghanistan in the abstract systemic way, because they just dropped way down in the budget index, they're one of the biggest losers, the biggest loser in the IBP. Or do we say, you know, there's a couple of ministries that in the, in the, in the Ghani administration, health, education, gender, where the minister has the technical competence and political will, we could make huge progress by transparently investing through those ministers and ministries and deliver big outcomes and, and help the sort of progressive, developmentally oriented politicians in that environment gain more power for the next election, just the way we helped Ghani do it. And that's the point I'm making. I take your point that it's temporary, that it isn't the long-term fix, but we are in a moment of transition where we have to make smart short-term bets to get that jolt of, of movement. It is uh, after 11 and we were here to 11. Thank you all. But before we go, Warren, it's your report. This is your baby. This is what you worked to over the course of three years this time around. 
What would you like to send people home with? What thoughts would you like them to, to take away as, uh, as they head out of the room today? So, so the major thought um, is use it. This is great data. It's hard to put it together. It's a global database. It's tremendously powerful. It's accurate. It's useful. Use it. As I said at the beginning, if, we're going to in, if you're going to work on transparency as one essential condition um, <clears throat> for transforming development, um, we're going to need to work together. And so we all have different ways in which we can use this data to form a partnership to overcome some of these you know, hurdles in, um, in, in ensuring not just greater transparency, but more effective and more equal politics because just to pick up on Paul's point, the, the budget is politics. There's no way around that. Um, but what you really want to know in a budget discussion is that you're hearing from everybody, that you've got the best sources of information on the table to make the best kinds of decisions. And that's, I think, at the heart of what the Open Budget Index is about. Thank you. Well, I know that uh, Secretary Abad, because it is after 11 o'clock, has now left us. He's, he's dropped the link from the Philippines. But we thank him for joining us. We'd also like to thank Neil Cole, who is in Pretoria. Neil, thank you very much indeed for taking the time with your team and joining us. Sorry, we, we probably could go on for another hour with more questions, but it's 11 o'clock here and people have got days to get on with. Uh, Daniela, Mario, Warren and thank Paul, you. thank you very much indeed for your valuable contributions. Thank you all for coming and for your questions. Thank you for the technical team and thank you for taking the time to come and discuss this very important document. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.